workshop for the academic year 2020-2021. This is the seventh year that we have been hosting the workshop, but it is the very first time that we are doing it virtually. Of course, the dynamics will be different. We do not have the luxury of sharing the same physical space or experiencing that warmth that comes with face-to-face -face interaction. And I know that students look forward to a day away from your schools when you could also visit the university that many of you hope to soon attend. So yes, this year's workshop is different. This new online presentation is definitely different. But if you really consider it, these normal circumstances that we have become accustomed to are peripheral to the objectives of the workshops, which are to provide assistance to students studying for the CSEC exams. This year's workshop represents our new normal, and maybe the COVID-19 pandemic has pushed us into a direction that was inevitable, and the I say, possibly even more practical and efficient. In keeping with the restrictions mandated by the COVID-19 pandemic, our presentations have been pre-recorded and have been posted on the History Department's YouTube channel. They are half hour sessions on topics selected from your syllabus. You can post your questions in the link provided and you can rest assured that your questions will be answered. When we really consider this new scenario, it does provide you with one huge advantage. You can revisit the presentations as many times as you wish. We in the Department of History continue to be very aware of our role as keepers and disseminators of knowledge of the past. And as we have done before, we are and will continue to take all the necessary measures to ensure that we fulfill this responsibility of keeping the discipline of history alive and applicable to the present and the future. Additionally, our penultimate goal is the molding of young and not so young minds towards the creation and fostering of informed, well-rounded and well-rounded adults who can make positive and valid contributions to the development of self, nation and region. Pandemic or whatever other hurdles may come our way, we will not be deterred from achieving both these goals. I must remind you that history is way more than just about writing and passing exams. It provides you with the tools with which and the foundation on which empires have been built. Let us be the architects of our society, taking it into the future on the back of its history. Also, you are now part of our country's history where, for the very first time, we are experiencing a pandemic in such a pervasive and almost debilitating manner. You are also part of the UWI's history since for the very first time, teaching and learning are being done virtually. As has been done throughout our region's history, students must rise to the current challenge and let it not debilitate you or deter you from excelling in your studies. Our online presentations are geared towards assisting you to achieve this excellence. So students, engage our new virtual forum. Visit the presentations as many times as you wish. Post whatever questions you may have. Appreciate the richness and relevance of our history and be inspired to further your studies of history in your tertiary level studies, hopefully at the UWI. On that note, let me once again welcome you to our virtual CSEC workshop. This session will be done by Dr. Michael Tusser. Dr. Michael Tusa is a history lecturer at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. He specializes in the history of the African diaspora, of European imperialism, and of the Caribbean. He has published work on the migration of African West Indians to Venezuela, the evolution of Caribbean politics and culture, and many other areas pertaining to Caribbean history and the history of the African diaspora. Hello, my dear students. Good day. I am Dr. Michael Tusse of the Department of History at the University of the West Indies, St. Augustine. Let's begin. Today, 
we are talking about the movement towards independence and regional integration in the Caribbean up to 1973. Our focus is the English-speaking Caribbean. The idea of federating the West Indian Islands dates back to 1800. It was a go an idea of the British government, not so much an idea of the West Indian leaders or West Indian spokesmen. And it was aimed at governing all or some of the British West Indian Islands as a single administrative unit, as opposed to a set of administrative units governed individually. For example, the Windward Islands was governed as the Windward Islands Federation from 1883 to 1958. Tobago itself was aligned to Trinidad only between 1889 and 1988. The Leeward Islands were established as a federation from 1871 to 1966. Dominica was made part of the Windward Island Federation in 1939. So federation is was a, a, a old idea when it came fully to confront the West Indian Islands from after World War I. They began discussing the Federation in 1932. Prominent among the discussions, however, were T.A. Mauricio from Grenada, and Captain Andrew Cipriani from Trinidad and Tobago. And they were interested in the West Indian Federation with a constitution drafted by West Indians and for West Indians. Spurring this idea would be the arrival of adult suffrage in the 1940s. Promoting this idea too, was the labor riots that occurred after World War I, particularly those of the, 19, the late 1930s. As these developments took place, the call for federation became stronger. A significant voice would have been the West Indian Labor Congress, which became known later as the Caribbean Labor Congress and a commission established to look into the causes of disturbances in the region began to think and propose indeed recommend the establishment of a West Indian Federation with full internal self-government on the basis of adult suffrage. In 1947, two years after the conclusion of World War II, West Indian leaders met in Montego Bay and the meeting was entitled Conference on Closer Association of the British West Indies. The participants were a wide cross-section of leaders from labor, politics, and community establishment and institutions. They accepted the principle of a West Indian Federation but did not go as far as accepting that of a region-wide federation. But as the, the noise became louder and the voices became louder, the idea of federation became more attractive. The idea a federation was acceptable to the British government because they had contemplated that in the first place primarily with the intention of reducing administrative costs. But it was necessary to negotiate this federation. How was that federation to be established? How should it take shape? Negotiations towards the Federation was guided by Britain and it was conducted solely between West Indian politicians and the British administrative representatives. 
negotiations too were conducted outside of the region. The masses in the British West Indian territories were not involved. At any rate, the talks that were proceeding led to the establishment of the West Indian Federation. The Federation itself was established by what is known as the British Caribbean Federation Act of 1956. And the Federation became operationalized by 1958. Many of the leaders of the Federation hoped that this Federation, this grand unified West Indian political administrative body, would be a vehicle towards the achievement of political independence. Some leaders, like George Price of the British of British Honduras and Chedi Jagan of British Guyana, did not consider the Federation to be the best way forward, and they did not participate. Point we are getting at, students, is that from the start there were questions about the viability and the appropriateness of the West Indian Federation. Let us consider how this federation was governed. On the basis of these negotiations, it was decided finally that a federal government headed by an executive governor general who was to be appointed by Britain would be established. It also included the following concerns and the following steps and units and officials. A prime minister elected from among members of what we know as a House of Representatives, which we have here today, so that this House of Representatives concept anticipated what we have now and was intended to be a reflection of what existed in Britain. A prime minister elected by by and among members of the House of Representatives, which was to consist of 45 members elected from the various British West Indian territories. This apart, there was supposed to be a cabinet, which would be constituted in the form of a prime minister and other elected members chosen by him to be part of this cabinet. Then there was to be a Senate, nominated, however, by the governor, following consultation with the prime minister. In addition to that, there was supposed to be a Council of State presided over by the Governor General. The Council was to include the Prime Minister and members of Cabinet, as well as three Senators and three civil servants. The Senators and civil servants were to be chosen by the Governor General. So it was similar to what we have in some Caribbean countries and what we have in Trinidad and Tobago, with some differences, of course. And that will be the subject of another discussion. But what is interesting, and what needs to be noted, is that the Governor General was selected by the British government. In fact, he was Lord Hales of Britain, and the Prime Minister of the Regional Federation was selected among Caribbean Premiers, and the one chosen was Grantley Adams of Barbados. And the territory that was supposed to carry the federal capital was Trinidad and Tobago. Well, my dear students, this federation, this Grand West Indian Federation, lasted from 1958 to 1962. It was short lived. Of course, during its short time, it attempted to achieve some federal things, including the establishment of some federal policies and some federal institutions. But there was always keen debates about the structure of the federation, its functioning, its applicability, and its advantages and disadvantages, particularly among leaders of the different territories. Perhaps the greatest concern was the establishment of a system of taxation by the federal government, one that will work to the benefit of the Caribbean nations. There was also a lot of discussion about central planning for development of the region. 
thought was given to the establishment of a regional customs union. What is a customs union? A kind of trading block consisting of free trade among the members trading without certain kinds of restrictions such as um, import taxes and you know tariffs on goods and so on. So there was thought about establishing a common external tariff and that is a common external tariff was a tariff in relation to foreign trade or trade with people outside the region. So we were talking about a free trade area and reducing the trade barriers, the import duties and quotas and amounts that could be imported between one state and another so that you have a freer flow of goods. There was a lot of consideration about opening the borders as it relates to trade and travel. All these, initiat all these initiatives, my dear students, relate to what in the business of international trade and international economics and international relations we refer to as secondary levels of regional integration, a higher level of regional integration. There was discussion about initiatives to develop a West Indian shipping service for the transportation of goods within the region and even from within to without. And there was discussion about cooperation in the respect of tertiary education. But the issue that was the most troublesome factor was the question of direct taxes of the populations inside each territory. Okay. The Federation was not permitted, however, to impose taxes for the first five years of its life because of the controversy. And because there was great diversity and division among leaders about how the taxes were to be imposed. Which countries were part of this Federation? There were, there were 10 member states, Antigua and Bermuda, one, Barbados. Dominica, Grenada, Jamaica, Montserrat, St. Kitts, Nevis, Anguilla, St. Vincent, St. Lucia, and Trinidad, and today. By 1962, the Federation was dissolved. It had crumbled. Jamaica got independence in 1962. On the 6th of August, Trinidad followed that same month in 1962. Uh -huh. The 31st of that month. And Guyana and other nations moved towards political independence a few years after. Guyana 1966, Barbados 1966, the Bahamas 1973, Grenada 1974, Dominica 1978, the list goes on, St. Vincent and the Grenadines 1979, Belize. 1981, Antigua, Bermuda, 81, St. Kitts and Nevis, 1983. The big problem and the start to this phenomenal collapse rested with internal developments in Jamaica. Jamaica was the largest member of the Federation in terms of size. And there was concern by some nations, including the people of Jamaica, who had not been part of the negotiations, that Jamaica, it seemed, would be when the taxation business starts a big pig being sucked by young ones because the taxes that were to be levied in the different member states were supposed to be taxes for the people who belong to member states but the stronger member states the larger member states were to help the weaker member states so in jamaica there was this big debate between the head of government in Jamaica and the opposition leader, Manly and Bustamante. And they decided to take the matter to the population and they had what is called a referendum. The population decided in favor of withdrawal from the Federation and so Jamaica could join from the institution and immediately proceeded 
to seek and was successful in achieving political independence from Britain. Trinidad and Tobago followed shortly afterwards, as we have seen. Now, I remind students that not all of the West Indian islands are on the same level. So when some nations became independent eventually, there were still countries in the West Indies, the British West Indies, that would remain British West Indian territory that would be non-independent, Bermuda, Montserrat, and Willa. But what was interesting in all of this is the mathematics of Prime Minister Dr. Eric Williams when he was exiting the Federation and following in the path set by Barbados, the pathway set by Jamaica, sorry. He came to the conclusion that 10, one from 10 leaves zero. Remember the Federation had 10 members. So when Jamaica pulled out, he said, according to his conceptualization of mathematics, one from 10 leaves zero. If we look at the problems we have talked about, taxes, the fact that the leaders of the Federation embarked on this journey to federate without being in consultation with the population, the fact that most of the decisions and the discussions took place in Britain, the fact that the islands were different levels of development, we would understand that there is a mass of problems facing the West Indian Federation from the start. There is also the rule and character of the leaders. The British government, of course, wanted federation because of administrative costs that continued to be exorbitant and difficult to handle. But generally, across the globe, there was a sense that the British government and other European powers were weakened by World War II. There's a calypso that says no one, nobody wins a war. Although they had been successful, the British and its allies in the war, they were weakened by the expenses and the damages and the devastation caused by World War II. And in addition to that, around the world, there was an intensification in the quest for nationalist power. In the quest for autonomy, the nationalist movement had grown. There was the rise of socialism and Marxism, or what some people combine theoretically into communism, sometimes in practice. Then there began the Cold War between America and its allies. And those people who commit themselves communist or socialist thinking, Soviet Union, and so on. Then there was the rise of Islamism. There was the nationalist movement in India. There was the nationalist movement in Africa, in Southeast Asia and other parts of the world. So the West Indies and the British West Indies and its native leadership, the leaders who have sprung up from these societies, were echoing a universal cry for greater autonomy. Trinidad had its peculiar issues. Chagramas was chosen as the site of the federal cap, uh, 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 the, uh, the capital of the Federation. And the purpose of history is to understand the past and understand the present that has been decreed through that past. And there's always evidence of what has happened. History leaves its mark. We have in Trinidad and Tobago a place called Federation Park because Trinidad was to be the, the headquarters of the capital or the site of the capital of the Federation. A park was constructed so that all the leaders can have some measure of residence and some office space in Trinidad and Tobago, and that place still existing today is called Federal Park. 
when Eric Williams was concerned that this is if this is the capital of the Federation, and we are saying that the Federation speaks of a measure of political autonomy, how could it be that this Federation, which had been granted as a lease to the American government by the British government, should remain in that state. Actually, during World War II, the British government, under pressure, under the stress of war, and challenged by the enemies, had leased several parts of the British West Indies and other territories to the American government in order to secure certain kinds of military aid from America. And they had leased Chagaramas and other spots in Trinidad and Tobago by what is deemed or termed lease-based agreements. Eric Williams waged a tremendous battle of vitriolic and questioning and querying and dismissal of this lease demanding the return of Chagaramas. And it was returned. But coming out of the Federation required British consent and the British government did what it usually did with respect to many colonial territories. It stated clearly that certain assurances were necessary. For example, the Premier of Trinidad and Tobago and the leader of the position and the ruling party, Trinidad and Tobago, in Trinidad and Tobago, had to discuss this idea of political independence and satisfy the British government that they were both on board and there was consensus about this important step. Again, most of the discussion took place in Marlborough House, House in Britain. And the questions about which they were haggling and debating were as follows. The question of whether they were going to have free and fair elections in Trinidad and Tobago if it became independent. Whether there was going to be equality of opportunity the need to create independent commissions to prevent discrimination and unfair treatment and to provide um, to prevent unfair treatment and to ensure equality before the law. All of these conditions, assurances were met eventually and Trinidad headed for independence. Among the special institutions that were created to protect the rights of citizens and prevent discrimination were the Judicial and Legal Services Commission, the Police Service Commission, the Public Service Commission, the Salary Reviews Commission, and later on, as we have now in our evolution as a nation, a continuity of that pattern with the Integrity Commission and the Equal. Well, Opportunities Commission. It is not true that there were no achievements or no gains regarding Federation in 1962. The very year that the Federation collapsed, the remaining eight countries, the little eight as they were called, attempted to set up a Federation among the smaller islands. The attempt was abandoned in 1965. But the same issue existed. The amount of aid to be given to different islands, and that would have been affected by how effective the tax system was, so that you can raise taxes in some islands and help others. Here's something that you should know. Some of the gains that were achieved was the establishment of the University of the West Indies, and this is by the West Indian Federation, okay, or the advancement of the University of the West Indies, it wasn't always an institution by that name, its development, 
and the Caribbean Meteorological Service so that they can check on weather patterns because, as you know, the region has been victim to hurricanes and susceptible to natural disasters related to weather and other things. The development of the West Indies Shipping Council. All right? So after Federation and after its collapse and the disappointment of the Federation and the disappointment of the little eight as well in terms of its survivability, what happened to take the question of regional integration forward? Well, in 1965, the premiers of British Guyana and Antigua and Barbados, Antigua Barbuda and Barbados, set up plans to establish what is called a free trade area. Again, the free trade area is the idea of trading freely and moving goods and service and capital freely and um, reducing the, the, the inhibitions of, you know, regarding trade among the territories and setting up external tariffs and so on. In accordance with this objective, the University of the West Indies held a series of economic debates and studies aimed at increasing production and trade within the region and improving Caribbean transport. And a decision was taken to go towards this challenge in a frontal way through the establishment of CARIFTA, you know, the short for the Caribbean free trade area. A decision was always taken, was also taken to establish a tariff to secretariat because if you have the institution, you have to have staff and you have to have people who are monitoring it and working with it to ensure its growth and development and increasing adaptability to the needs of the region. And there was also the development of what we know today as the Caribbean Development Bank. In addition, the countries were divided into, member countries were divided into lesser developed countries and more developed countries. And this categorization was aimed at determining and organizing the nature of the flow and the development of business, the nature of the flow of business and the development to effort and the initiatives and bringing everything together so that we can really envisage a region that is operating with consensus on trade and other matters. The Carifta Agreement was established in 1968 with the following members, Antigua, Barbados, Trinidad and Tobago, and Guyana. Later that year, these member states were joined by Dominica Grenada, St. Vincent, Nevis, Angola, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, and the Grenadines, and then later by Montserrat and Jamaica. But it is important to remember that there are some Caribbean countries that are not independent states, and that what they do is heavily determined by the kind of relationship they have with the British government. What are the aims of character? To be more precise, increasing trade, buying and selling more goods among member states. So the wealth of the Caribbean, a large part of it is used for Caribbean development. Rather than you have to export all this money or, 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 or you have to get all this foreign, uh, you know, this, this wealth, this financial uh, strength to purchase foreign goods and to pay for it. Diversifying trade, having more products produced, this country produced that, that other country produced this, and so we we are able to exchange in the region. Liberalizing trade, move, removing tariffs and quotas, ensuring fair competition among nations in the region, so that there's not going to be a lot of argument and distortions and distractions over whether members are complying with the rules and the system of fair trade of free trade can also be a system of fair trade. Implementing measures to help the lesser developed countries. Because as long as they are developing, they can produce a lot of stuff that is needed, ensure that their national incomes grow and further participate in trade and development of the region. The 
development of agricultural marketing protocols ensuring that the region, among other things, can feed itself, providing guaranteed markets. These are just some of the issues that they sought to grapple with. So CARICOM was an important step in the right direction. And here's something that you should know. Tariff timing was an important step in the right direction. And I think you should also know that it's within the framework of this institution that we had the establishment of CXC exams and later CAPE. For those of you who are unaware, people who belonged to my generation, we did exams that were set in Britain. The questions were set in Britain and the correction of these examinations was done in Britain. That's the UK. And it was felt that in order for the region to develop, the region needs to question its education system and structure it in favor of the development of the people of the region, rather to, than to simply accept the direction that was shaped by Britain and imperial powers of the region in terms of educating our people. Also coming out of this was a body called the Organization of the Eastern Caribbean States and the establishment of the Associate States Councils of Ministers so that the ministers in the region can work together to explore problems and devise solutions. But the major step in CARICOM would come after CARIFTA, or the major step in CARICOM integration, I want to put it this way, would come after CARIFTA, and that is with the establishment of the body called CARICOM. CARICOM is the short for Caribbean, the Caribbean Common Market. And this was established in 1973. And there are three pillars or three structures on which it stands in relation to three critical aims, economic development, which rests upon greater economic integration, functional cooperation where whatever the problems are in the region we can get together as a region and try to solve them through cooperation at various levels political economical cultural social education what have you and then the coordination of foreign policy that is to say the caribbean must present a unified position or be prepared to present a unified position on foreign policy matters, that is in relation to countries operating outside the region and in relation to world affairs. In other words, the Caribbean must have a view. CARICOM is still in existence today and we have come a great distance in terms of what was intended and what were its objectives deepening economic integration by advancing beyond a common market, which is CARICOM, and moving towards a single market and economy. A single market, a huge Caribbean market with the exchange of goods, a huge Caribbean market with a common policy towards foreign countries and foreign products. Widening the membership of the states that belong to this body. We've done quite a bit of that. Suriname and Haiti, for example, we were admitted as full members in 1995 and, 19, and 2002, respectively. The third objective is a critical stage because it's a sort of tertiary level, not merely secondary. And that's the progressive insertion of the region into global trading and economic systems by collectively strengthening trading links with 
non-traditional partners. So we have the traditional partners, including the colonial administration or former colonial administration, and then other peoples who and nations who want to trade with the Caribbean and relate to the Caribbean. But how do we ensure that we face them as a collectivity, as a collective group? Because when you look at the Caribbean, the Caribbean is con is con uh, it consists of different islands and different subgroupings. And it is always easy for foreign powers to reach out to a particular Caribbean nation and break the capacity of the Caribbean people to negotiate on the basis of the strength of the region. We are an, a region of islands and that separation by water and that tendency that we have had historically to be rivals to one another can work against us unless we are united. Okay, so we have what is called CARICOM. Some members of the region have gone further than others in strengthening the autonomy that they experience. There are challenges in CARICOM. Not all the governments are at the same level. Some of the countries have what is called constitutional monarchies, the vast majority of them. That means they have a head of government, a prime minister. But I want students to recognize the difference between a head of government and a head of state. The head of the state is really the British government acting through its representative, the governor general. Some countries are at that state. However, some territories have progressed beyond that. And they are republics where the head of state is a national and the head of government is a national. And they have what we call a president. So a presidential system of government as opposed to a prime ministerial system of government. In this respect, among the English speaking nations, we have some lone wolf situations. Trinidad and Tobago has done that. And we have what is called, or was called the Cooperative Republic of Guyana. The other nations have kept away from that. But in doing so, we are provided with evidence of the continuing metropolitan influence and in a sense the unwillingness or the inability of West Indian nations and their leaders to separate themselves so they put in control of their decision making process and they are in greater control of the question of autonomy in their you know in terms of their own development. A good example is the Caribbean Court of Justice, which forms part of the development of CARICOM. That's our regional court of appeal. But when we have court matters, West Indian nations and people tend to turn to the Judicial Council of the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, which is based in the UK. And that's an indication that we have some distance to go. But then there's also the problem of small island developing states, which we call SIDS, small countries with very small populations in the region that are susceptible to natural disasters and other challenges because of their size. And it's very easy for countries across the globe to look upon them as pers perspective fail states that mean their states can fail you know if they cannot progress to another level of development some of the caribbean regions are very vulnerable but of course these problems can be solved if we are prepared to strengthen the integration movement at this point as we are drawing near to the close of our discussion i want to speak to students about this business of Caribbean integration, about a Caribbean single market and a Caribbean single economy, single market and economy. 
students would have noticed in the news and in the um, television programs and in the various media discussions about the UK and Britain exiting the UK, you have combined into a single organization called the Union, the European Union, because of the advantages of collaborating and integrating. And as we conclude on in this discussion, I want you to envisage yourself as citizens of the country to which you belong in the British West Indies, but also as citizens of the region itself. Because we have gotten to the, 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 the stage of CARICOM where we need to tighten up the single market and the single economy because there is strength in collectivity and there's weakness in division among member states. So I want you to envisage a world or a part of the world, this Caribbean, that you are hearing about and which was intended by the move towards integration in the first instance. I want you to, to think about this dream that we have of being a region in the world without internal borders so you can travel from one Caribbean island to the next just as you can go to one beach and one town and one one city or one municipality in Trinidad and Tobago you can go to other islands of the Caribbean and you can share with them in their cultural experiences and the development and challenge and continue and, and contribute to their development and they can contribute to our development so without borders within the region, a region without work permits, you go where employment is possible, you go where there's the need for development and you contribute and you work. And that mean, would mean having a passport that can carry you around the region. A region where the standards are uniform in terms of what we produce, what we expect, what we exhibit, what contributions we make to the world. A single passport for the CARICOM people, the CARICOM citizen. The free movement of capital, that means money for investment. So somebody can open a business if they are from Trinidad, they can open one in Barbados, and they can open one in St. Vincent. And our banks can do the same and develop our capital with financial and mechanical and develop investments and ensure development in the region. A region in which you have CARICOM citizenship and the defense of the region so that when something happens in one part of the region, there is collective defense against that challenge. A wider, deeper, far more integrated Caribbean. That's what we are talking about. And very importantly, since we are talking about history, a region in which the descendants of enslaved Africans and Indian indentured laborers can have been able to and continues admirably and appropriately to change the life of the people of the region, doing that for themselves and contributing to a better world. In short, a region of boundless hope, a region of achievement and opportunity for individuals and for the collective betterment and greater enabling of world civilization. Thank you very much for listening.